Hello, everyone. Today we are talking to Port Ryan, and we have been looking forward to this for a long time. He's uh, quite the man. So, Picks and Jesus. <laughs> what's, what's up with that? <laughs> what's up with Picks and Jesus? That's a good yeah. question. <laughs> um yeah what is up with pigs and jesus um yeah god used pigs to to humble me and i dare say save my life through that um i used to be super arrogant stubborn and uh, thought i knew everything and mm -hmm. pigs were one of the only creatures i dare say the first creature to actually allow for me to see that um i didn't know everything i didn't have control over everything and uh i needed help those were three things that pigs helped me do. Uh, I remember first interning at a farm before I started managing other operations. And uh, first time raising pigs outdoors, I got the, the cattle down packed, I had the chickens down packed, I had the goats down packed, and everything else down packed. But when it came to raising pigs for the first time, I was struggling. I mean, like pigs were breaking that infrastructure, breaking through fits in, going out having pig parties in other pastures that they don't belong in. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> it, it was infuriating. Uh, it was infuriating to like the, the, the systems that I designed, but it's also infuriating to just my ego. Yeah. Like I'm supposed to have this figured out. Why don't I have the pigs figured out? This is so stupid, right? But instead of me looking internally, I looked externally and made them the problem. Oh, they're the reason why this is happening. Not that I'm the reason why. But uh, I had a faithful encounter with uh, one of the sales that I was working with at the time. Her name was Louise. And um, I remember being asked to, well, having a day off, being asked to go back to the farm because Louise had broken out of, I think, three or four different infrastructures. All the other apprentices tried to put them in and she kept breaking out. And um, I was managing all the livestock operations at that time. So when they failed, it was my job and responsibility to come fix things. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll be on right back then. And uh, remember coming back, uh, corralling Louise into our isolation pen, had plenty of pasture, a uh, little shelter, had some straw bedding. Uh, there was some water, there was feed. She had every single thing that she needed, mm -hmm. everything. So then I lock her in there and we had a chain link fence gate for that. And I was like, okay, I saved the day. I did this. This is all my achievement. Look at me, look at me. And uh, walked away with a lot of confidence, but then something just didn't feel right. So uh, I like, hmm. turn around as I'm walking away and I see Louise by our isolation pin gate. And she was just sitting there and she's an English large black, which is a heritage breed, a black pig. And they have floppy ears. So you actually can't see their eyes, but yeah. you can see that they're looking at you through their nose holes, right? You just look, <laughs> pretend those nose holes are the eyes. And it's yeah. like, ah, she's looking at me. So um, I, I looked and I was like, ah, she's fine. She's fine. Yeah, everything's okay. So then keep on walking, keep on walking. And I was like, oh, let me look one more time. And I look back and... It's like, yeah, 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 she's good. I'm going to go back to what I was doing. And so I almost got to my uh, car and I was like, you know, something just doesn't feel right. So I turned around one more time and I could see Louise, uh, not, not just see her, but hear her. She had this bellowing screech that went like, sick, 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 sick. and oh man, she bulldozed that gate. Right? <laughs> She just completely obliterated. She was about 600 pounds. Yeah. So one thing that pigs don't do, if you don't raise pigs, I'll, I'll give you a little hint, is they're very earthbound creatures. Yeah. And all day, if they're out on pasture or out in the woods or something like that, they're doing this. They're mm -hmm. moving their head down and up, down and up, right? So for her, she was really trained in doing that. So she was so trained in doing that that she actually lifted the gate off of its hinges and flung it into the air. Whoa. When I mean flung, I'm talking like like 10 feet, I, I dare say 20, I don't want to make it a tall tail, but <laughs> I, I, I think maybe somewhere between 10 to 20 feet into the air. And that thing just flew, it said, Stoo! and I'm just looking there like, what in the world? And so then the gate flops down and, and you can see like a triangular dent to where her nose met the bottom <laughs> frame of that gate. And I'm just sitting here like, what in the world? And then this pig, she comes trotting to me, like this doop, 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 
and she got her little floppy ears going side by side. She's swaying her hips while she's running towards me. And I've never seen that pig trot in its entire life. No. <laughs> never. It looked dignified in that <laughs> moment, right? So uh, she came up to me and I was just completely flabbergasted. I, I didn't know what to do at that point. And all the frustrations of just raising pigs at that time really just welled up in me. And I realized that I, I didn't know what to do next. Um, so I, I got down on one knee and no, I did not propose to a pig. <laughs> But what I did do is I, I grabbed her by the jaw. She had big fat jaws, um, nothing but lard in those jaws. And uh, I just said, you know what, Louise, I, I'm gonna love you so hard that just maybe I'll understand you because right now I don't. Yeah. And that was a pathway I feel like that helped me understand what it meant to love in a lot of ways. I had been through a lot of broken experiences as it relate to love, um, both with family, friends, and romantic interests. And so uh, I had a lot of learning to do. But pigs help me understand love through observation. When you love somebody, you're observing them. You're, you're understanding them. You're, you're not putting yourself into, uh, you're not projecting yourself into them, but you're allowing them to project into you. So I remember uh, on my pathway to understanding them, just sitting on a metal folded lawn chair and uh, just watching them play in the pasture for hours. I spent hours just watching. And oddly enough, I never got bored. And that's how you can tell if you're a real pig farmer. If, if you can watch animals <laughs> or pigs for endless hours and never get bored, you're a pig farmer. And bravo, congratulations, <laughs> you made it into the club. If not, then you got to ask yourself whether or not you like pigs. Because either you love pigs or you hate pigs. There ain't none in the middle. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I realized that I had fell in love with this animal. I started to understand that the issues I was having with the animal with breaking infrastructure, being ornery, those were not their problem. Those were my problem. I was creating issues, situations, and environments that were not ideal for them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so by being able to observe them, I realized, oh, that's why they're doing that. Because I didn't give them enough water. Or I didn't give them enough space, or I didn't move them more frequently, or I didn't feed them enough. That's why they're doing these things. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. so I, I took the responsibility and the blame away from them and onto myself. And I think that's what a true farmer is. Uh, I started to develop what I like to call a farmer's eye, where it's not just having, um, it's not just, uh, was it feed, water, and shelter, right? Those three things. Yeah. Uh, but it's all the context in between them. And that's when you understand those parts and how they interconnect and how you connect back with them in terms of your responsibility. That's what a farmer's eye is. So it's no longer living by a, a, a simple rule that you can find in the book, but it's being uh, very contextual with approaches, very contextual with philosophies on how to raise pigs. And that's where my tagline, uh, wisdom without the hogwash came into place. Uh, Cause I do believe that wisdom is not about uh, just simply understanding facts, but how, about how to apply those facts in a wise manner within your context or your situation. Right. But this is really interesting. So you're talking about having uh, love for the, the pigs and like we, we love the animals and the humans as well that, that we are around. And, but when you're a pig farmer, you gotta end up uh, like having to have them slaughtered at some point. Otherwise, it's uh, you don't have a business. Uh, you just have a hobby. And I saw a recent post by you talking about you don't uh, believe that uh, animals have souls. <laughs> <laughs> you've been you've been watching my Instagram stories, huh? Of course I have. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, let's talk about that. Um, because it, it's really interesting. Like, because I I believe that since we are made in God's image and God is everywhere and everything, then everything, like even the medium that we are talking through now, which is a computer and a camera, it is imbued with some soul aspect. And we should treat every, we should yeah. treat everything according to that. Yeah, there's consciousness and everything. Right. That's, that's yeah. my perspective on this. But I don't know if consciousness and a soul is the same thing. Yeah. So, so that's what's your take? That's a good question. Um, 
So to give your audience some context, uh, the reason why I had made that post is uh, I think the full post was um, if you I mean, my dogs. Yeah, it was about dogs. So like yeah. if you walk up to a uh, dog and their pet owner, right? And before even asking the person their name, you ask the dog for their name. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's where it started. So I was like, you know, I, I just hope if you're doing that, I just hope that you understand that the human it, it should it is important in this situation, right? Yeah. Not that the dog shouldn't have a name, right? Mm -hmm. But that the human has a soul. And one thing yeah. I said was dogs don't have souls, but humans do. Yeah. Uh, so part of the reason why I um, said that was to really show people that where are you putting your priority in your interactions and engagements? Yeah. Um, are you putting it into an animal that uh, sure has an impact on this world and even in, in human society, but who has the greater impact, right? It should a dog be acknowledged. I'm pretty sure it'll have a the dog be happy and, and, you know, wagging its tail, but what more impact would it be to acknowledge another human being yeah. who you don't know their story, you don't know the reality, and maybe they're having a bad day and you just acknowledging them and saying their name first. Because uh, what, one thing pet owners don't tell you is that they get kind of annoyed when all people care about is their dog rather than them. Yeah. And it's not a selfishness thing. So I was just exposing that aspect of it. But to kind of talk about your original question, uh, part of the reason why I say animals have no soul is because, uh, again, I'm a Christian. Mm -hmm. There is nothing defending or pointing to that being a reality, um, both in scripture. Uh, so that's part of the reason why I say that animals don't have souls. Now, mm -hmm. in terms of like consciousness, I, I think that living creatures have some form of consciousness. I, I, I'd include myself into that. But even as a human, I know that my consciousness is limited. Yeah. Right. That's where my connection with God comes into place, where I have a greater sense of conscience because I'm more connected with him. Uh, I also do believe that God is in every living and unliving thing mm -hmm. on this earth. Um, but I don't think that necessarily means that every living thing is imbued with a soul. Uh, because of a soul, there's a responsibility of you can either choose God or reject God. With mm -hmm. animals, they don't even have the consciousness to even understand God, right? The way that we understand God, at least. Now, yeah. there's some research saying that uh, you got elephants performing rain dances and, and worshiping the moon. So maybe that's God to them, uh, yeah. or maybe we're just misinterpreting. Who knows? Uh, but what I do know is that humans do have a soul. Uh, and that I want to point people towards what is eternal. Dogs are not eternal. Just like I tell people at a lot of the homesteading conferences, uh, homesteading is not eternal. Yeah. Farming is not eternal. Learning about uh, how to um, have a farm business by Joe Salton is not eternal. Learning from pork rind about how to raise pigs is not eternal. I can't take that with me when I go to heaven or hell. I can't mm -hmm. take that with me. But what is eternal is my relationship with God my relationship with other people. That also includes people on the internet. And I've been getting on people about that, myself included, because a lot of times they say, oh, well, I'm a good person. I, I have good interactions with people that I'm around. Okay, so then what have you been saying uh, over the last couple of years online during these political debates, these yeah. social debates, yeah. right? And I, I get on the Christians, because we are the most notorious for this, I do believe, um, and we should be shamed for it to a certain extent, uh, that we don't speak from God. We either speak for ourselves or we speak for God. I tell folks that God don't need your help, right? He asks or he invites us to be a part of community. He invites us to execute his will, but he doesn't need our help. He can always find somebody else, yet he still gives us the invitation. Yeah. And so with that, I think about the prophets, I think about the disciples, I think about Jesus Christ himself and how um, they all spoke from God. They didn't add their own words or interjections. And when they did, except for Jesus, um, it was made very known that it was wrong. Mm. Um, and there were consequences for that, whether uh, big or small. So I try to operate from a place of how do I speak from God? How do I have a relationship with God to where I'm listening to him mm -hmm. and saying the words that he wants me to say. Sometimes yeah. uh, I can be angry and I can make it about mm -hmm. myself and my own anger, not about what God wants. 
maybe I want to tell somebody off on the internet and God's yeah. actually like, no, you need to be compassionate towards that person. Yeah. You don't understand that he just got divorced today. Yeah. Last yeah. thing he needs is for you to be rambling about how he's wrong. You know, so I, I tell people that, you know, what's eternal is our relationship with God, our relationship with people, including on the internet and our relationship with ourselves. And we can't neglect the ourselves part in this because I think a lot of people, um, burden themselves with uh, trying to be everything for everybody, yet they themselves are nothing yeah. yeah, because they don't put the time and energy to work on themselves. Uh, and so that's, that's, the, that's the conundrum a lot of people face. But once we understand these things, everything that we do can now point back to those eternal things. Mm -hmm. So although Joe Salton's books might not be eternal on a surface level or by itself, I can always use that information and point back to eternity through my relationship with other people, through my relationship with myself, my relationship with God. What I teach at these homesteading conferences, the exact same principle would apply to that as well. How old are you? Uh, 29. I'll be 30 by the end of the year. Uh, oh, man. <laughs> I wish I were that. Now, now we are <laughs> one of those old people who said... Uh, I wish I was that clever when I was your age. Yeah, wise. <laughs> yeah. How did you get so wise, young man? <laughs> um, I just say God. Um, I've so part of there are two parts to it. Uh, originally, I was just knowledgeable, and there's a difference between like being knowledgeable and being wise. Yeah. Uh, so when I was younger, I, I have gray hair. Uh, I have gray hair since I was five years old, and so. Um, mythologically, if you have gray hair at a young age, that must mean that you're a wise person. Now, that ain't always true, <laughs> but um, in my case, a lot of people, especially older people, did see me as a person who was uh, wise or at least knew a lot of things. Mm -hmm. um, I was always curious about not what kids my age were doing, but about what adults were doing and what they were thinking. I want to be a part of those conversations, which made me very obnoxious as a child, um, you know, but for the adults that did entertain my curiosities, I grew a lot from that. Uh, however, you know, in terms of actually imparting wisdom, it, it took me going through a lot of pain and suffering, um, not just through childhood traumas and experiences, but also through my own, um, me causing self-inflicting trauma, mm -hmm. right? So uh, I tell folks, and I'm very open about it, even at conferences, that uh, I'm a recovering addict from multiple addictions. Uh, the way that I define addictions are uh, coping mechanisms that uh, either lead me away or replace God and community out of my life, right? So if we have that kind of definition, a, a lot of things open up to that. For me, the things that um, would be the most profound is uh, sex and porn addiction, alcoholism, codependent relationships which are not always romantic um food oh yes food we're gonna talk about that we're gonna talk about food and then media, <laughs> and then media addiction which uh for me would be the internet and social media uh people can also include books in that yeah. uh i never had a problem with books um so those were the things <laughs> oh, see, this. see there you go there you go i read um, so i read so much i couldn't like i got blind yeah <laughs> from he, time to time he read a book a day yeah. when he was a kid yeah. wow yeah. see i wish i was that smart um not <laughs> it's not even being smart just that that focus uh people say i got adhd i can't stay focused long enough to read a whole book a day um i could probably listen to a whole book today but to read it oh no 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 no, no. um <laughs> Go so, on. Yeah. but yeah so that those were things that really defined a lot of my life um you know, before uh, porn and sex, it was food and codependent relationships. Mm -hmm. I often tell people that um, any, not every uh, codependent is an addict, but every addict is a codependent at the least, where I'm either making God, uh, I'm trying to be God in someone else's life by controlling things, controlling other people, places and things, or I'm desperately seeking other people to be my God because I, I feel hopelessly out of control and I need someone else to fill in that role of God in my life. Um, so when you look at it from that perspective, those things cause a lot of pain in my life. Uh, just, just, I mean, both um, emotionally, financially, uh, spiritually. Uh, I was living in a lot of fear and anxiety on a daily basis, 
only into recovery did I, I realized how much I was living in anxiety and depression um, and just blatant fear, not knowing what my next day was going to look like, always wondering, will someone ever find out who I actually am? Uh, and that's stressful. That's so stressful. Um, but addiction is just a symptom of fear. Addiction is not the real problem. The real problem is it's fear and the character defects that, that inspire our fear. Character defects would be like pride, being prideful. Really, my pride is not because I think I'm right. It's because if I believe that I'm right, I feel like I have security and I have power and I have control. And that provides security for me. But if, but pride is also on the other spectrum. So you have pride through arrogance, but you also have pride through self-pity, right? Which is a belief that, well, if I can't do it, no one can do it. No one can do it. You know, that's the same thing as the, the, the jock in, in school thinking he's the best thing since sliced bread, yeah. right? Thinking he can do everything. Yeah. So uh, that's how I look at my life and only until recovery, which for me is, is not just simply a 12-step program like AA, mm. but it's also getting back in community, getting back to a relationship with God. Uh, and, you know, being able to go to a 12-step recovery group is part of my community. It's part of me reconnecting with God and also me reconnecting with myself. Um, being able to come, go back to a church community is part of me connecting with God, other people, and myself as well. Did you um, have faith before all this happened or... Or did that come after? Yes, I, I did. I have, and someone argued or debate that I didn't. But you know what? I'm just going to say to make like math simple. That did have faith. Uh, I grew up in a Christian home, uh, but life just was still challenging despite mm -hmm. all that. Uh, and around the time that I was 14, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Um, Somewhere in that moment, uh, within three years, my grandmother, my half brother, and my grandfather, all of my dad's side of the family, had died. Mm -hmm. oh. um, grandparents from cancer, uh, half brother died from um, being shot by a five year old. Uh, so, children and guns don't go together. They just don't. Mm -hmm. um, and he, my, my half brother actually was about to walk out the door before he got shot. So, that's how how uh, I dare say divine that was. I didn't go to any of their funerals because I resented my father who left me when I was eight years old and I haven't seen him to this day. So it's been 20 years. I still have not seen the man. Um, but I had a lot of resentment and bitterness towards this side of the family, uh, felt ostracized, felt rejected. And that feeling wasn't just exclusively to my father's side. I uh, felt rejected even with my mother, felt rejected or felt like a burden to my mother, felt rejected at church, felt rejected at school, didn't feel like I belonged anywhere. So mm -hmm. I had all these feelings of loneliness, inadequacy, of feeling like a burden that uh, I was living in a whole lot of anxiety. Um, I mean, that's where I believe my ideations for suicide first started or running away. Um, never ever felt the need to actually commit suicide, but I always thought, what would happen if I died? If I died this way, if I died that way, who mm -hmm. would come to my funeral? Who would be there? Mm -hmm. Would they grieve for me? And just thinking that it would be better in a lot of cases to just be dead mm -hmm. than to continue living in this perpetual cycle of loneliness and fear and inadequacy and feeling unworthy. Uh, and around that time, I realized that that disease of fear was so sickening um, that it was robbing me of, of life itself um, from a spiritual standpoint. So around that time, I remember going downstairs one night and just asking Jesus to come into my life because I felt like I had no other option. And uh, I keep hearing about Jesus being the way, the truth, the light. I want to try him out. Mm -hmm. I had already been baptized by that point, but baptism doesn't really mean anything from a um, uh, Christian evangelical standpoint from Catholicism it's different yeah. but from a, a, a Protestant um, standpoint it's a little different than that just because you're baptized does not necessarily mean salvation it's just a um, physical representation of salvation potentially um, but I want to say six months after that um, was when I developed a porn addiction right 
So then we talk about being a Christian and watching porn. Yay. And, <laughs> and no one, no one in the evangelical church wants to talk about um, lust or, and if they do talk about lust, it's from a very strong standpoint of you shouldn't be doing this. And if you're doing this, this is wrong. Not necessarily, here's how to practically navigate through this. And yeah. so because there's been a lack of honesty, a lack of vulnerability in the body of Christ, the church, regarding lust, sexual temptations, or immoralities, it's become this huge issue that has kept perpetuating itself, right? So then we start talking about the uh, priests who, or the pastors who are molesting children. We mm -hmm. talk about how, despite uh, us being Christians, you know, in the Christian church, that we still have the same, in America, the same divorce rate as everyone outside of the church. That's yeah. very ironic. How is that, right? Um, we talk about infidelity, fatherlessness, the even stuff that I experienced, and how that plays a role, how lust plays a role in that. Uh, but no one's talking about it. So, you know, in my sex addiction recovery groups, I'm get, I'm sitting around pastors and priests. Yeah. Who are too afraid to talk about their struggles in the pulpit, which means that since they're not talking about it, well, the world's going to talk about sex and what marriage should look like. And so now people will be learning from the world rather than from yeah. uh, a, an authority figure who's supposed to be leading them spiritually. Yeah. Uh, and it's unfortunate and it's sad, but it's the truth. But it all comes down to that that hole in, in the heart, like we're trying to fill it with, well, bacon <laughs> and, other, and other, other stuff that we think can, can satiate something like, so we go for uh, beautiful women or fast cars or money or food or whatever yeah. we think can, can like, dampen that that scream from from our hearts that something is missing in our lives yeah and so we're trying to we're trying to find it out there somewhere because we've been told all the times like the answer is outside of ourselves it's not in that connection because that's sort of been taken away that's at least that's the feeling i had like and and when i met god I mean, all that went away. Like now I'm down here mostly, <laughs> but uh, so I still get a lot of those things, but like in there, in that connection to God, there's like everything, like all those dry rivers are filled. Amen. Amen, brother. Amen. <laughs> yeah. And part of being filled is staying in the present. Exactly. Uh, in, the, in addiction, we talk about how one of the best ways of staying sober uh, on top of your relationship with God is being a present, um, accepting life on life's terms. Mm -hmm. And so when we're not present, when we're in the past or with the things that we've done, uh, or maybe oh, uh, the good old days. I remember the good old days. I'm not living in the good old days, so I can't be content with my present. Things mm -hmm. like that then we're always going to be discontent. When we're thinking about the future, we're worrying about things that we have literally no control over. You know, we can't stay present either. But mm -hmm. when we stay present, we get to see people as they are, uh, not as what we think they should be, what they ought to be, but who they actually are. This is really important for people who are married uh, because you got a lot of folks who married people based off of potential, not off of who they actually were. And this is where you get a lot of butt hurt spouses who are like, well, I thought, I thought, I thought um, Suzanne was going to be better or different. Why is yeah. she still the same way? Well, hey, Suzanne was like that when you first met her. Yeah. Why'd you, why'd you think she was going to be anything differently? Yeah. Right. So, you know, it's important. And even when people completely flip on you, understanding, at least from a Christian perspective, that What's important is, can I love this person today? And the answer to that question is always yes. Mm. The, the caveat to that is whether or not you're willing to ask God for help and to receive that help. Uh, God's going to give you his divine spirit, but he's also going to put people in your life that are going to hold you accountable and that are going to give you wise counsel. Uh, mm. Unfortunately, we have a lot of families that feel like they can just solo life together. Uh, 
however, their input's only coming internally through themselves in their household. So then they're having problems that keep perpetuating themselves, but they got outside help, whether through professional help, whether through just having honest and vulnerable friends who can think and look objectively at people, at them as a couple, and call out some things out of love and out of respect. But when we don't have those honest friendships, family members, then how are we ever going to expect to, to know what we're doing wrong other than through God's spirit? God's spirit, part of his spirit's also uh, in a working through the people around us as well. So we got to do all of them as well. Yeah. Got to be honest with each other. Yeah. That's yeah. Um, it's been missing in this world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's but that's why um, X Factor is is so funny to watch the auditions. All the people who were told lies. Oh, watch X Factor. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All the people who go to auditions and they cannot sing and yeah. and they get mad at the judges because they're telling them, "I'm sorry, but you cannot sing at a note." And they're like, "But all my friends and family, they told me I could sing." And I have a beautiful voice. I'm like, no, maybe you should do something else. Are you good at something else? So <laughs> it's, maybe you should uh, get better relationships. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's just so sad that people have been lying to them. Yeah. And, and that's the thing. That's the reason why I am who I am today is because I've been lied to a lot of my life. Mm. People who are not honest and vulnerable around me most of my life people mm. who retaliated against me out of fear because they wouldn't be honest with me most of my life and so the lack of honesty for a child it, it greatly impacts them as an adult if they do not live in honest environments they themselves become dishonest and yeah. it's not it's not necessarily completely their fault either right i um i tell my story about being a child and uh, how dishonesty started with me. Dishonesty started with me uh, because uh, let's talk about academics. I think that was one of the first ways of dishonesty really creeping into my life. Um, whenever I asked my mom for help, and my mom was a single parent, uh, not by choice, and um, she had me at 19, so almost 20 years old. She herself is still technically a kid, kind of, mm -hmm. legally yeah. an adult, but like still a kid. Her brains not even fully developed biologically speaking yeah. um so you know her having to raise me having to climb a corporate ladder so that way she can provide for not just herself but also me that mm -hmm. way i can have a future a bright future that way her child could actually have a lawn a backyard because we were living in apartments and in townhomes right she wanted the best for me and so what she sacrificed was a lot of her time and her energy uh, to to make more money. However, what she didn't realize that she was sacrificing was um, her peace of mind, her femininity, uh, her, her, her desire to um, be present in the moment. So whenever my mom would come home, uh, she was oftentimes drained emotionally, physically, mentally, spiritually uh, from just being in a harsh work environment. Mm -hmm. And she was just not present for me a lot during those days. Uh, so when I asked for help with homework or had a problem that I need to navigate through with a, a math problem or a worksheet, um, there was a lot of frustration, uh, very short temper, irritability. And that's what reinforced that I'm a burden to my mom mm -hmm. is just by those kind of responses that I got from her. And so in order for me not to be a burden, I need to be perfect. Well, if I need to be perfect, then I shouldn't ask for help. I shouldn't mm -hmm. need help. Right. So although I was not cognitively thinking that I was subconsciously doing these things, having these thoughts uh, and reinforcing those thoughts, both through my mother's behavior and my behavior. So uh, if I got a bad test grade or a bad report, um, instead of being honest about my mom, I knew that that was going to frustrate her, make her mad, make her angry. And then again, this feeling of being a burden, being a let down to my mom who sacrificed so much for me who sacrificed her dreams for me. I don't want to do that to her. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to lie about it, which is for me, postponing the inevitable. But I'm going to postpone it just so that way I can fix things. I just need a little bit more time to fix things. I, I know I can fix it on my own. And I kept saying this lie 
not just as a child, but as an adult and as a grown man, right? Even in my early to mid twenties, I was doing this, except yeah. as a child, it might be cute or a little annoying, but as an adult, there are some major consequences to being yeah. dishonest and not having integrity. Uh, yeah. And I had to learn the hard way. I had to learn the hard way until I, I accepted that my pathway, especially as recovery teaches, needs to be of rigorous honesty. And I dare say rigorous vulnerability, because there's a difference between telling the truth, being honest, and being vulnerable. Telling the truth is saying, hmm, it's raining outside. Very factual, part of reality. Being honest is saying, I forgot to bring an umbrella. I forgot to bring an umbrella. No, just, I, I, I forgot. But being vulnerable is saying, it's raining outside. I forgot to bring an umbrella. And this is how I feel about that. Yeah. I feel stupid. I feel like an idiot. Why did I forget to bring an umbrella? I'm smarter than this. Yeah. I should have known better. I should have checked the weather. But you're taking, that's, that's you're taking that sense of vulnerability and and honesty into your into the business aspects of your life as well so um so when you are like teaching people about pig farming and stuff like that you're you're not uh just like blowing hot air and showing people oh this is the wonderful world and blah 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 but you're showing them the realities of, of, of that aspect. So maybe we could talk a little bit about your, um, the business aspect of you, how your, your teaching aspect uh, and, and pig farming and, and how that is. Good point. Um, how did you yeah, get so there? How did you get to that, like, uh, of being a, like a pig farming teacher? <laughs> pig farming teacher? Uh, <laughs> Well, you know, I tell folks, and this is important. Uh, I remember being in college and, you know, I was, I won a national award through the USDA as a college student. And so, um, and I was in the animal science program. So I was, I was on, on par to really be uh, going places, mm -hmm. agriculturally speaking. But I realized that the, my trajectory was going to go towards Tyson chicken. Is going to go towards Cargill, JBS, hmm. um, Smithfield. And those did not resonate with my childhood experiences, seeing um, animals play dynamic roles in dynamic ecosystems. Yeah. So uh, I had a midlife crisis at 23, 24, and uh, realized I needed to figure something out. So I had an extension agent director um, who was a good mentor for me. And he said, you know, Ryan, what, what do you want to do career-wise? And he said, you know, I think I want to help farmers. And keep in mind, I didn't have any farming experience. I did not grow up on a farm. So he said, okay, well, if you want to help farmers, go farm. Yeah. He said, go farm. I was like, oh, okay. Like at the college, because every land grant university has a college farm. Yeah. And so my college had one. And he's like, no, 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 no. You need to make a living. Yeah. off of farming i just have to interject one thing because uh, we have speakers from outside the u.s so a uh, cargo and all those other uh, brand names you mentioned they, these are huge industrial farming uh, well farming industries where like massively abusing animals and stuff where it's it's just like chain abuse whereas the farming that you're doing is speaking to the the animal itself and giving it the respect that it deserves and also the farmers involved are being given the the respect and space that that they deserve as as humans and in the interactions with animals so out of the industry well it's of course it's an industry but it's a completely different thing and we have of course a huge pig industry in in Denmark as well where pigs are being penned up in very very small spaces and this is not the stuff that you're doing. So I just want to clarify for people. Thank you, brother. Um, but yeah, so, you know, I realized that I need to go farm. Mm -hmm. So I remember making 500 USD a month, a month to live off of, mm -hmm. a month to live off of. Now, if I was making that much money in Uganda, oh, yeah, I'll be fine. 
Yeah. Making that much money in the United States of America? <laughs> You're not fine. That's rough. Yeah. Um, but so I I worked like a dog working the land and working animals. And it allowed for me to see the hardships. And it's not just the it's not just the financial hardships, it's the emotional and mental hardship, the physical hardships of farming. Mm -hmm. If I never experienced any of that, I would be an awful educator. Yeah. Yet there are so many people, both um, local extension and uh, even some folks on YouTube who never went through that, yet they mm -hmm. still call themselves teachers. Yeah. And that's in uh, all industries. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you know, I think that's what separates me from a lot of other folks is that I actually earned my stripes. I, I got the marks to prove it both mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually, um, and allows for me to be more dynamic. I'm able to understand the context rather than just reading from a script that I learned from a book. Yeah. Um, and so that's part of where that vulnerability comes into place because I can connect with people on a different on a deeper level because I've experienced the hardships that they, they've experienced, right? I've experienced emotional hardships. I remember losing my mind while farming, right? I, and having a mental <laughs> breakdown. I remember that. Yeah. yeah. And so I can teach people how not to experience that. And if you do experience it, how to navigate out of it or through it. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's something that's priceless. If you have a, a and that's why I tell people to get mentors who are experienced, mm -hmm. not mentors who have just as much experience as you do, or maybe even a year more experience than you do. But someone, no matter what the field is, no matter what the expertise or skill is, uh, someone who has proven success in that field, that skill, and also still has a smile on their face. That's important too. That's a good point. <laughs> there are a lot of experience, people who are grumpy and old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And have no joy about doing what yeah. they're doing. Yeah, don't go looking for those people. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <sighs> People who really figured it out. Yeah. It was like, yeah, I thought this was really important in the beginning, but then I realized it wasn't, it was something completely different. And look how funny that is. <laughs> God has a sense of humor, right? Yeah. <laughs> we, we, uh, when we were studying martial arts in, in, in China, uh, we had, had this old guy teaching us and he was like, why, why, should, why should you practice like this? Why should you practice every day? Because it's fun. Yeah. Look <laughs> at just, me. Look at me. And then you throw us around. Yeah, and like, look, look how heavy I am. Yeah. While, and, he, while he was beating us up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I love it. Oh, great time. We were thinking, oh, because then we can just kick everyone's ass and, you know, we can yeah. be tough guys and girls. And yeah. No, no that wasn't just, the reason. Yeah. He was just happy. To be happy. Yeah. Isn't that, isn't that beautiful that you don't have to have another reason other than to be content with yourself and the rest of the world? Yeah. That's the best reason if there is, like just and, being You know, here. everything is Kung Fu. Yeah. So farming is, is Kung Fu too. Yeah. So you're, you're learning a lot about yourself and the world and how to have peace inside of you. And then everything just makes sense and you're content and happy and it's... It becomes like a, a simple, life becomes simple. Mm -hmm. You just need to be there, yeah. show up every day and do what needs to be done. Yeah. And then have everything be an extension of that, that inner peace and connection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One thing I tell people is when you get to that point, you no longer, and, I, and for me, it's like when I accept life on life's terms or I dare say God on God's terms I no longer have to fight for love because now I accept that I'm already loved mm -hmm. and that everything that I do can now be an overflow or an, ex an overflow of God's love for me to them an extension of God's love to them rather than fighting to obtain love from people who will never love me mm -hmm. or for people who don't know how to love me more than God does yeah. Right. Same thing with um, uh, trying to think. 
had another thought. It vanished. That's okay. Well, I can come back later. We can talk about like uh, this experience we talked about right before we started recording was I've been fighting for like 10 days to pay a stupid, very, very small bill. I spent hours each day fighting the system. And when I gave up, like after I've been talking to like everybody involved, the bank, the banks involved and the Swedish Ministry of Transportation and nobody could do anything or budge. And then I like, I'd write, I just wrote on Facebook, can anybody help me pay this bill? And uh, then the Swedish friend, yeah, sure, I'll do it. And then five minutes later, it was done after me having spent, I don't know how many hours struggling against something that somewhere in my mind, I knew I was going to end up at that place because it's happened before. Yeah, you know. And, it, <laughs> and it, when I let go. Yeah. And it's 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 spilled over on the rest of your family. Yeah. You were in a really bad mood for a Ooh. Ooh. preach it, preach it, keep going, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> keep going. You, you get y'all something, keep going. Don't take a man while he's down. <laughs> <laughs> but now you're up again. Yeah. Now you, and you have you have friends. Yeah. People are stepping up and saying, I'm your friend, I want to pay your bill. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna pay her back, oh, but yeah, some other way, like. I can pay her. It yeah, doesn't matter. I know. So the example <laughs> is here. Let go and let God. And it's a lot more simple than people think. Yeah. You know, it's just, can I accept that I'm a prideful person and that I'm in need of humility? Yeah. And if I can do these two things, live in acceptance and have action with humility, which sometimes look like asking for help. Yeah. Again, every addict struggles with asking for help. I know I did. Uh, and I dare say every person struggles with asking for help. Some people ask for too much help. And that's a different, that's a different story. Um, you know, but uh, when we ask for help, we are often surprised how God's love can be reflected so deeply when we receive that help. Yeah. Asking for help can change our life if we allow it to. Um, I think sometimes there's this fear of like, well, if I ask for help, I won't get the help that I need or that I think I deserve or uh, things won't work out, right? And ultimately, it's just like, well, just try. Yeah. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. That's okay. You know, rather than festering this resentment and this anger that will leak onto unsuspecting people in unsuspecting ways, mm -hmm. like you ain't mad at your wife and your kids. You're mad about the system. Yeah. yeah, because it's it, that anger is being unresolved, right? It's leaking out on people in inappropriate ways, unappropriate people that it'll only be leaking onto them, yeah. and it's hurting yourself, right? right? And you're not able to be present because now you're thinking about the future or you're thinking about the past. But when you're present, things become a lot more simpler. And, uh, but it's also the thing about like like wanting the the help to show up in a specific way, like you want the the solution to your problem to show up in a specific way, and when you put on those blinders and you just you stare yourself into that little narrow space, you can't see all the glory, and you can't see all the hands reaching out like and and sometimes it's not what you need you think it's what you need but you need like for your development you need to go in another direction and when you ask god for that help it's going to show up but maybe not in the specific way that you want it like and, and then the challenge is to accept the help yeah if and you, accept the way life the way life shows up again it's like with our with our daughters like if we didn't we didn't want a handicapped child but god gave us a handicapped child because we needed that development and we wouldn't have done it if she hadn't been the way she is so she's been kicking her ass all the way and we're still not done apparently we're still, <laughs> so we are still getting our asses handed to us every single day because because we're two stubborn people <laughs> yeah. yeah but she is um, the most stubborn yeah, she's more stubborn than us, so yeah. that's uh, that's good for her and uh, <laughs> and us apparently. Keeps you humble and healthy, right? Yeah. Yeah. As y'all were talking, I thought about um, 
you know, in the United States, we've been having some um, political debates regarding uh, abortion and regarding gun rights and stuff. Oh, it's spilling over. It's oh, not no. just in the U.S. Oh. It's like it's yeah. made the whole nope. thing explode oh, everywhere. We're the, trendsetters. Women here. in Denmark, they're, go, they're going on the streets next weekend, I think it is. And they have no clue what, is, what actually passed, like why it was overturned and what it actually but, means. But, like, they're they're, but they're really they're, mad they're angry. about something they oh. know nothing about. It's, They've been watching too much news, that's why. Yes, so but, infuriating. Oh, but wow. as you were talking, I thought about that, and I thought about uh, that teenage mom who has a child, and it's just ruining her plans. Mm. And I think about my mom being in that exact same situation. Yeah, I was on a chopping block for abortion. Yeah. Like, it was an option for my mom. Yeah. Um, you know, especially after realizing that my father wasn't who he said he was and actually realized he had no intention of even raising me. Um, you know, I was on the chopping block. My mom, it, she could have lived in that fear and have aborted me. Totally mm -hmm. could have. But the beautiful thing about being in that situation for my mom was she had to come to a conclusion whether or not she could accept life on life's terms or God on God's terms. Mm. And there have been so many people who have been blessed by my existence, despite me being uh, struggling with depression and addiction and all these other things, um, you know, despite all the things I've gone through in life. If she aborted me, all those people in East Africa that I go serve once a year um, and help them reestablish their identity and their community, mm. that wouldn't happen. All these people who are living in fear and anxiety, even in their homesteading community, wouldn't have a vulnerable voice speaking into their life. Yeah. I, I get DMs, emails, uh, private messages, texts from people who are like, thank you, Pork Ryan, for being honest, being vulnerable today. Thank you for, for, for sharing your testimony, your experience. Uh, man, the last conference, the second last conference I spoke at, the Homestead Festival in Tennessee, Right after one of my sessions, a woman came over to me and she was just like, uh, hey, Pork Ryan, you know, can I, can I, can I talk with you real quick? Can, can you pray for me? I was like, yeah, yeah, sure. And there are a whole bunch of other people that wanted to ask me stupid pick questions. I love pick questions, right? But <laughs> like, right now, I, I want to focus on what she has to say because it's really important. So, you know, some people were still lingering around waiting on me to finish my conversation with her. And she's just like, Pork Ryan, um, you know, I, I'm here at this conference alone. Uh, my, my, my husband, he's uh, an addict and it's just getting really hard for him right now. Um, you know, uh, uh, to be honest, I'm here at this conference to just get away and have some space uh, because I, I don't know if I need to consider divorce. Mm -hmm. I don't even know this woman. Yeah. I've never met her in my entire life. But that's what honestly vulnerability does. It, 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 it brings out the need to be honest and vulnerable in other people. And so I got to pray over her and her situation, over her husband, over her household. You know, uh, several, I think the next day, uh, a woman just randomly came up to me and she's like, hey, I just wanted to say, loved your session. My son loved your session. And we had a really good time. I was like, oh, cool. You know, great, great. Every time someone comes up to me, I always ask at the end, how can I pray for you? Mm -hmm. Normally they mishear me and they say, they think I said, I'll be praying for you. I'm yeah. like, nah, I ain't doing that. I, how can I pray for you, yeah. right? And then I pray for him. And so I asked her and she's like, well, you know, I got a lot of fear and insecurity about my, my, my kids. You know, I, I'm divorced and, and their father is, is trying to entice them to be the favorite through uh, buying new items, a new car. Uh, and, you know, I feel like they're going on a, on a deadly path. I don't know if my kids will have faith at the end. And have a lot of fear and insecurity about that. So then I prayed with her. I had some um, farming friends with me and we just prayed over her. Mm. If I was aborted, that moment of peace would not have came to that woman or the other woman or the other man and women before her or after her. Yeah. Those moments of, of clarity and of vulnerability would not come if I was aborted. And I think that's the beauty of my mom accepting life on life's terms, God on God's terms, is she allowed for just the hope that maybe 
God has a great plan for this child, yeah. a great, wonderful plan for this child. And I had to go through a lot of things. I was evil in a lot of ways, but God redeemed my life. And I'm grateful they even had the opportunity to be alive. Um, but I give God all the glory to that. And I give my mom for just having that hope and being willing and able to accept that God is trustworthy, even if it doesn't match up with what she wants out of life. Yeah. And with that, I'll pass. Wow. How, how y'all feeling? Let's do a quick feelings check-in. How y'all feeling right now? Touched. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good. I'm, I'm, I'm really touched by that. Yeah. Yeah. And it, yeah. And yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a deep talk about that, about that issue, right? Yeah. Because it's, it's not, it's not the child that's the problem. It's never the child. So, and, uh, and most women think, the child is the problem or the man or, or just men in general are the problem, but it's not. And you can, you can ask yourself that question. So why do I want an abortion? Is it because most women, they always say, well, incest or rape, right? But maybe it's just, I don't have enough money for it <laughs> or I'm too young or the time isn't right or whatever. Mm. And so, so what is the problem in, in reality? And it, maybe it's, uh, maybe instead of going to fight for uh, the right to abort your children, maybe you should go on and demand uh, like safety, general safety for everyone, because then you have room for kids yeah. and no, a uh, great communities where people can help each other with raising that kid so yeah, yeah it's I mainly fear health care and yeah. you know it's yeah it's it's fear and the fear comes out of the systems it's it's all the pressure and all the stress and i cannot do it by myself and all the things you can tell yourself mm. it's because we we've been divided uh, but who's been doing the dividing the system because the system is made up of people. Yeah. Just yeah. as you said, the fear is coming out of the system. The system is only is a, is a product of humanity. So yes. therefore, if the system is bringing out fear, it's yeah. because people are breeding fear amongst themselves. Yeah, we separated yeah. ourselves from, from God each and, other and, and yeah, God. Yeah, yeah, we separated. We Maybe at one point we were told that God was some kind of non-existent, right? Yeah. Or evil. Or, yeah, or evil and wanted to punish us. And then we started doing crazy stuff and divided ourselves. Punishing and, each other. Yeah. Instead of loving each other. But well, amen. Amen. But I think about that and I think about the issue is, uh, and I will bring people, I have no problem talking about controversial stuff like this, but I'll say to folks, you know, your problem is not against the system. Your problem, for those who are pro choice, um, in terms of pro choice for abortion, mm. you know, your problem's not, not the system. You can fight the system all day long and sure you'll win some battles and you'll lose some battles and they will go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Um, but, and your problem's not with men. Although I do think men are a part of the problem and this, we can talk about how we need to raise up a generation of actual men and not boys. Um, that, that's a whole other podcast. But what I will say is, you know, the problem is, <laughs> Whether it's, it's, <laughs> whether it's a one night stand or even a product of rape, right? Your problem is against God. God allowed all that stuff to happen, whatever that yeah. stuff was. And so do you trust God that despite what happened, that it's going to not only change your life, but it's going to change the world, that that baby can change the world, that the experience yeah. that you're going to go through is going to change your life in a meaningful direction? Yeah. Uh, I tell people, uh, God, and it's, it's written, God gives the bread of adversity and the water of affliction. It is written in scripture. Hmm. He is coupling provisional words such as bread and water, things that we need to live off of, right? Hmm. Spiritually speaking, metaphorically speaking, even physically speaking, but he's coupling them with 
uh, harsh words, adversity and affliction. But we need that to be human. We need that to see our need for God. Even in uh, the uh, epistle of James, it, it talks about how, um, you know, through hardship produces perseverance, through perseverance produces faith. Mm. Without perseverance, I have no faith. Without hardship, I have no perseverance. Uh, and so those moments, uh, considering abortion, that's a hardship. Uh, like my mom, realizing that the man that she thought was going to be with her for the rest of her life actually isn't going to be for the rest of her life. That's a hardship. That's scary, right? There are so many women who are in that situation. So many women are in that situation. There are also men who are in that situation as well, where they're excited about the child being born, you know, despite it not being planned. Mm -hmm. But then the woman goes off and gets an abortion anyway. I actually know someone who recently experienced that. Um, and he's not handling it well yeah. through alcohol, but um, men go through it too. There are a lot of men who are excited about bringing life into the world, even if it's unplanned, but the hardship of being in that situation. But I say even to the men, well, it takes two to have sex, right? And this is why it's important that know who you're having sex with. I think this is part of the reason why God designed marriage and, and unity within marriage. So that way you can be protected from situations like that, hardships like that, lessons that you don't have to learn. Um, I had to realize that the hard way with just my um, uh, sexual adventures mm -hmm. uh, and how I hurt myself so many times and I hurt other people because I would not accept God on God's terms of what he wanted for my life when it came to my sexuality and my behaviors as a man. Mm. So it, it really, at the end of the day, is not having a problem with the system. The system's not the problem. People are not the problem uh, in those cases. The problem is, can I trust God that he knows more than I do? And that just maybe if I go on this journey with him of trust and of mm. faith and through perseverance in these hardships, that I will experience the greatest love that I've ever experienced in my entire life, the greatest joy that I've ever experienced in my entire life, the greatest peace that I've ever experienced in my entire life. A lot of people don't have that faith, but when you have community around you that can support you, that can remind you that's going to be okay, that's, that's the problem with a lot of these women is that they don't have this community and support that they need, right? Yeah. Not just from the man, but also from the family. They're being shamed by the family and say, say you know what? This is not ideal. I'm just going to be honest about it. It's not ideal. But we are here for you. Yeah. We want to support you, whatever you need. We won't have to set up some new rules and figure some stuff out. But we're on your side. We're on that baby side. And we'll help you the best that we can to make yeah. sure that you feel protected. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we need those We need those communities to come back. Like, that's a, that's a, a huge thing. We need much more community. We need connection to ourselves and God. And I do believe that it's coming back in a strong way, hmm. finally. But it's taken, well, it's taken 40 years in the desert. <laughs> plus. <laughs> plus. Plus. <laughs> well, I remember, I remember when the community disappeared uh, in the light late 90s. Oh, that's about 40 years. No, <laughs> no, no. no. Uh, 20 years ago. I, I remember that. And that was really sad. We had a great community where I grew up and, pe and people never locked their doors and everyone just came to visit out of the blue and said, well, do you, do you have a cup of coffee for me? And mm -hmm. my mom would make a cake and, and the adults would play, they would play. And it just, it disappeared when I was around 17, 18 or something like that. And it just never came back. It's gonna was, come back now. It, but yeah, it's gonna come back now. <sighs> Thank you yeah. for, for just like peeling another layer of the onion with yeah. the with the god thing. Yeah. <laughs> that was that was I, I needed that because uh, in some area of my life I know that God is there and everything is okay. But somehow in other areas that doesn't count. That's really weird. And I was like, yeah. yes, of course. Yeah. It's the same. You're right. You're right. <sighs> uh, yeah. 
Thank you. This took uh, this took some some turns I hadn't seen coming, but this was a really beautiful, <laughs> really beautiful talk. Yeah, we're talking some about God work like this, and uh, it's not quite where, <laughs> but a lot of it got in there anyway. Yeah, you're a beautiful man, Bort yeah. Ryan. You're a beautiful man, both physically and spiritually. Thank you for our system. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for having me on. Uh, I, I appreciate the conversations they are having uh, because not a lot of people are having these conversations, or if they are, they're having it in private. And there are a lot of conversations that are being held in private that need to be held out in the open. Absolutely. So that we, everyone can listen. And sure, some people are going to give their, their opinions. Mm -hmm. We don't mind those folks. We let them still come to the meetings because maybe one day they'll yeah. realize they'll see the light. Um, yeah. But you're creating community, whether it's on YouTube, on Instagram. And so I just encourage you to continue doing that, um, continue having honesty and vulnerability, both on your podcast, both in your marriage, with your relationship with your kids, and um, focus on what is eternal, God, people, and yourself. If you focus on those things, you will not be led astray. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, man. Well... Is it, is it, can I close out with a very simple, small prayer? Yes, oh, absolutely. Cool. Uh, it's called the serenity prayer. Uh, if you're uh, listening and you're driving, do not close your eyes. Uh, <laughs> feel free to bow your heads and close your eyes. If you're a weirdo like me, you can keep your eyes open. Uh, but the serenity prayer goes like this. Uh, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. The courage to change the things that I can, most importantly the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we needed that. Shoot, I needed that. What you talking about? <laughs> <laughs>